Good afternoon. <laughs> My name's Sally Welsh, and I'm the CEO for HTNA, HTCC, and HTNF. Can't hear me. Um, we're really glad you're here with us this afternoon. I think this is going to be one of the most exciting and memorable events of the whole um, annual event for all of us. Um, let me get my script. <laughs> okay. We're here today to pay tribute to Nessa Coyle. Nessa, <laughs> 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 you're among 400 of your closest friends, <laughs> and there's many more. We are so excited today to officially launch the inaugural Nessa Coyle Palliative Nursing Leadership Lecture. In 2000, thank you. <laughs> in 2016, the Hospice and Palliative Nurses Foundation established the Nessa Coyle Palliative Nursing Leadership Fund. The purpose of this fund is to provide financial support for a variety of programs and initiatives focused on leadership development for hospice and palliative nurses. One of the initiatives the fund will support is this annual Nessa Coyle Palliative Nursing Leadership Lecture. So we're so happy to be, Nessa's with us today um, to kick off this inaugural lecture. HPNA is also in the process of establishing a task force to evaluate and make recommendations on the development of formal nursing leadership programs. Ab Brody is leading this initiative with us. Thanks, Ab. We have a commitment to our specialty to help encourage, support, and develop our future leaders. I am delighted that Nessa was able to join us today and share in this celebration of her life's work. I personally think of Nessa as a quiet and gentle yet powerful giant, <laughs> a scholar, a clinician, a mentor, and a true leader who has inspired so many of us along our journeys. Nessa is a graduate of the Columbia University Adult Nurse Practitioner Program. She has a PhD in nursing from New York University. She is a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing. Throughout her career, Nursa, Nessa has made so many contributions, it would be difficult to capture them all. But here are a few highlights. Nessa created and served as a leader of the Nurse Practitioner Fellowship Program in Pain and Palliative Care at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She is co-editor of both the Oxford Textbook of Palliative Care Nursing and the Nature of Suffering and the Goals of Nursing. She has been active in bioethics and helped establish the HPNA Bioethics Special Interest Group, which I'm proud to say now has over a thousand members. <laughs> NASA has served as international faculty for LNIC and has published numerous scholarly works. She has traveled the globe teaching, researching, and providing direct care for patients and their families at the most challenging and vulnerable stages of their lives. Today's speaker will recognize this quote from an anonymous author, I have drunk from the wells I did not dig. As Dr. Farrell wrote in a tribute, Nessa, the community of palliative nursing, drinks from the wells you have dug, and we are so grateful. <laughs> On behalf of the Hospice and Palliative Nurses Association and the Hospice and Palliative Nurses Foundation, I am honored to present you with this gift in recognition of your achievements on behalf of both the nurses that you have inspired and the patients' and families' lives that you have ultimately impacted. Nessa. <laughs> This is pretty overwhelming because I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but that's, that's as it should be. So um, <laughs> thank you, Sally, and obviously thank you, Betty. Um, I'm really thrilled and uh, honored to have my name associated with this uh, uh, HPNA Nursing Leadership Initiative. Um, and I'm also very, very grateful to the members of the association for having provided mentorship and guidance to me and wisdom to me throughout the years and always been there when I've needed them. So I'm very, very grateful, Sally and, and Betty, for, for all the help, and many of you in this audience, for all the help you've given me throughout the years. Um, the voice of nursing is very, very strong, and I think we're beginning to recognize it now. And certainly when I grew up as a young nurse, um, I didn't have nursing mentors, really. I had physician mentors, and that has now changed. So the whole way of nursing and nursing looking after each other and mentoring each other, I think in the last, I suppose, 40 years that I've been plus in nursing, um, that's changed dramatically, and we've come of age, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and really, at no time is... Um, the importance of nursing leadership being as it is now when there's this current era when uh, decent human values are being uh, undermined and challenged and really our most uh, vulnerable and voiceless are sometimes being trampled on. So nurses are working with these individuals all the time. So nursing leadership in this area is absolutely extraordinarily needed, particularly in 2016 or 17 now and onwards. We do already have uh, strong leaders in areas such as clinical care, research, policy, very important, bioethics, communication, spirituality. Um, and this is just to name a few uh, both specialties and also interrelating uh, patterns and themes, but we need to be able to encourage, teach, and mentor our next generation of leaders. And I'm thrilled to have my name associated with a fund which will help to support this. So thank you so much. Thank you, Nessa. As I mentioned, this is the first of what will be the annual presentation of the Nessa Coyle Palliative Nursing Leadership Lecture. Today, we are honored to have another nurse who embodies leadership within our field, Dr. Betty Farrell, and she will give a presentation on nursing leadership. Dr. Farrell is known internationally for her clinical expertise in research in pain management, quality of life, and palliative care. Dr. Farrell is the Director of Nursing Research and Education and a professor at the City of Hope Medical Center. She helped secure grant funding to the City of Hope Medical Center to prepare Doctor of Nursing Practice faculty to integrate palliative care content into the DMP curriculum. Dr. Fe Dr. Fellow, <laughs> Dr. Farrell is a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing and a fellow of palliative care nursing. She has over 350 publications in peer-reviewed journals and text. She is the principal investigator of a project funded by the National Cancer Institute on palliative care for quality of life and symptom concerns in lung cancer patients. She established the End of Life Nursing Education Consortium Project, which you will recognize as LNEC. LNEC, which is a Train the Trainer program, has reached more than 600,000 nurses in 50 states and 91 countries. <laughs> she is a member of the Board of Scientific Advisors of the National Cancer Institute and served as chairperson of the National Consensus Project for Quality Palliative Care. She has a PhD in nursing and a master's degree in theology, ethics, and culture. She has authored nine books, including the Oxford Textbook of Palliative Nursing. Oops. In 2016, WebMD named Betty Farrell a health hero. In 2013, Dr. Farrell was named one of the 30 visionaries in the field. 
by the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. Betty has been presented with the HPNA Distinguished Researcher Award and the Distinguished Career Achievement Award. She is Editor-in-Chief of HPNA's official journal, the Journal of Hospice and Palliative Nursing. And I know she has been a men mentor to many of us in the room also. So I'd like to welcome Betty to the podium. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today to honor Nessa. It's really a great honor for me to be able to uh, launch this wonderful uh, thing called the Nessa Coil Leadership Fund. And I really want to encourage all of you to contribute to this fund, either while you're here at the meeting at the HPNA booth or as you return home, because it will be through your contributions that the Nessa Coil Leadership Fund continues. And we all know the importance of promoting leadership in nursing. So. Uh, this is only the beginning of what we hope to endure uh, for a very long time. Uh, when um, we established this uh, Nessa Coyle uh, lectureship, uh, Nessa asked if I could be the first person to present it. And so in preparing for this, we really wanted to do two things. We wanted this to be the launching of a lectureship every year on leadership. But I also wanted to make sure that this first lectureship honored Nessa and her career. And so in order uh, to do this, I uh, enlisted the support of my colleague who's sitting here on the first row, Ellen Friedman. Ellen is a research colleague at the City of Hope. And Ellen and I decided that we would go back and review all of Nessa's work through her entire <laughs> career. Which, like, what were we drinking at that time? I don't know. It's kind of crazy. Um, never volunteer to review the life work of someone who's so prolific and wonderful as Nessa. But that's what we did. And uh, so this presentation was created in collaboration with my colleague Ellen in honor of Nessa. And also, being the obsessive compulsive people that we are, we decided we should also write a manuscript so that all of the people who aren't at this meeting uh, would be able to read um, this compilation of Nessa's work. And so there is a paper um, that summarizes all that I'll be sharing with you today that will be published in the Journal of Hospice and Palliative Nursing. So thank you, Ellen, for, um, for helping me to do this big mountain of work that I hope honors uh, and shares our colleagues' incredible achievements. Um, so this is Nessa, <laughs> right? And so this is Nessa, who is the young one uh, with her big sisters. And so I think this is our first take-home message of the day. What is the uh, leadership lesson is to be the little sister where from the beginning you're out there on your own. Um, <laughs> you have to protect your own ice cream and like, be in charge. So this is where it all began. Nessa realized that she had to be independent and be a leader um, to survive. And I look at that picture, nobody's taking that ice cream away from Nessa. So. Um, this is a wonderful picture. And so if you, some of you may not be able to see the picture quite so clearly, but that is Nessa in her nursing training at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. And so she's over there on the far right toward the front. and. What an amazing picture, right? What an amazing career. And so uh, thank you, Nessa, for helping to provide this. But um, just imagine you know, where Nessa has begun and what she's done now in um, about 60 plus years of contributions as a nurse. And one final early picture, uh, this is Nessa in her graduate, as a graduate training at the Neurological Institute. And, um, so Nessa's, Nessa is the nurse's nurse. She is the nurse that's always been at the bedside. And one of the things I really want to say in this lectureship is that often we say this word leader, and we might immediately think, oh, the leader is someone in the CEO's office, right? The, the leader is someone with lots of titles, but far removed. And Nessa Coyle has spent her entire career at the bedside. Nessa has led as a clinician. Nessa has led because she has never been very far away from the patients and the families. And so this is, this is Nessa's beginning, but Nessa's devoted her entire career to caring for patients and families. So as um, Ellen and I sorted through 
um, 60 years worth of every publication and project and all of her work. We then synthesized all of this into major themes from her work that we think illustrate um, leadership. So these are the leadership themes in her scholarship and her career. The first theme that I think Nessa teaches all of us about leadership is the role of the nurse in relieving suffering. You know, what do you do? When people ask you, what do you do? Um, what is your job description? You relieve suffering, right? And Nessa's really taught us how to do that. The second theme is that nurses relieve the symptoms of illness. Central to nursing leadership in this field is our dedication to relieving patient symptoms. The third theme is to define the paradigm of palliative nursing, and that is to comfort always. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that Nessa Coyle's been doing palliative care before there was palliative care, right? Nessa Coyle was inventing palliative care before the word was in our vocabulary. And in order to do this, Nessa didn't create a model or a field or a paradigm that nurses were anyway secondary, that nurses were dependent, but that nurses were independently um, contributing to the patient's care. And it was, though, the essence of comfort. The fourth theme is communication and that communication is really the essence of what we do. And again, I think through our work in Elnec and, and many ways, what we see is that so often nurses are not really acknowledged for the degree of communication um, that happens within our field of palliative care. A fifth theme is the theme of presence. I think probably every one of us in this room speaks about presence. We teach you know, our colleagues, our students, it is about being present. And yet, Nessa really taught us what that means. Nessa modeled that. Nessa really helps to understand what does it really mean to be present. A sixth and very important theme is illness as a family experience. It was some of Nessa's early work, and it has been her advocacy and her voice to say, when someone is seriously ill, it is a family experience, and Nessa really pioneered what is now emerging as a critical component, family caregiving. The seventh theme probably should be in big, bold, shining letters, and that is the ethical issues inherent in the scope of palliative nursing. And again, I just want to mention, this is what leadership looks like. A few years ago, there was no ethics special interest group in HPNA, and we just heard there are now 1,000 people who are members. And why? Because Nessa Coyle said yes to Sally, that yes, I will start an ethics special interest group. And now we have this wonderful network for nurses. And the final theme is mentorship of present and future generations of nurses. Because we are an aging field. Many of us in this room and many of us in this field were the people who started the field. And yet, we are at a place in our careers where we need to seriously think about our opportunities for mentorship. My colleague Pam Malloy, who's here um, from our LNEC team, Pam says over and over, you know, everyone needs a mentor and everyone needs to be a mentor. And Nessa, above everyone, has taught us what it looks like to mentor the next generation of nurses. So what I'm going to do is just to share with you across these themes where Ellen and I have extracted from Nessa's work some of the key lessons that we can learn from her scholarship. As I was uh, putting this together, I had a, a lot of wonderful photos from uh, Nessa participating in our international work over the last several years. And this photo was actually taken at one of our, um, uh, at a clinic where we were doing a training course in Africa. And that's Judy Pace's back that you see. But um, the reason that I selected this picture was because this is Nessa. This is Nessa Coyle. Nessa Coyle is rarely the person at the front of the room. She is you know, never the person that is receiving all the attention. But Nessa is always the person in the hallway sort of cheering you on. Go, Judy. You know, go. You can do it, right? Nessa is the person that's encouraging you know, that the nurse that's the first time to do an ethics consult or the new fellow. N Nessa is the person that is just supporting other people. And so I think that we can learn so much by 
those who have had the real pleasure of watching uh, Nessa in action, whether it is with her colleagues or with her uh, patients or families. So the first theme is the role of nursing in relieving suffering. And this comes from this absolutely beautiful article, if you've not read this, it's called The Hard Work of Living in the Face of Death. And this is, was just this amazing qualitative work that Nessa did. And what she said was through their intimate relationships with patients, nurses accompany patients on the illness journey. They support patients in confronting the weariness of living and dying. And in this really amazing scholarly work, Nessa really talks about the weariness. And she causes, you know, really asks us to pause and think about what is it like to be the person who is sick and exhausted and in pain and nauseated and overwhelmed. And that it is our job as nurses to accompany that patient and to help respond and be present to the patient's suffering. Um, this, some of the other contributions in this area, um, the, Nessa from our suffering book, witnessing suffering is the everyday work of nurses. That nurses are the constant presence for patients and families as they experience illness across all settings of care. And um, Again, I'm also pulling from some of the people who Nessa has most influenced, some of the people that she has mentored. The ability to be with suffering and bear with the sufferer is an art, generally mastered after extensive life experience, self-reflection, and concentrated professional development. I think one of the things that Nessa teaches us about this notion of responding to suffering is really in those last words, that it is not just a matter of being a nurse for 30 years, right? It is to truly be present and to respond to suffering. It is about bearing with, bearing with the sufferer. It is an art. It is about extensive life experience. It does not happen without serious self-reflection, and it is about ongoing professional development. Um, Nessa was one of the first people to really speak about and write about this notion that nurses may not restore function or fix a problem. And you know, we so often point to our medical colleagues and say, oh, medicine is trying to fix. Um, but nurses are also really, really intent on fixing things, right? We all went to that nursing school where if your you know, patient did not go through Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they were not fully functioning, eating, peeing, walking, um, by the end of your shift, you probably would not get a good grade on your, you know, care plan. And, and honestly, we as nurses also, also really want to fix things. And so Nessa really spoke very early on about the fact that nurses, what do nurses do? That nurses assess patients to identify sources of unnecessary suffering, such as unrelieved pain or other symptoms, expressions of shame, or feelings of spiritual abandonment by a God who has allowed serious illness or untimely death. Nurses diagnose sources of suffering and identify those that can and should be relieved, and they recognize the aspects of illness and suffering that should be witnessed and supported. And nurses intervene through presence, listening, and communication that enables patient expression and by eliminating sources of suffering such as pain. This, um, again, from the nature of suffering work, nurses constantly evaluate to meet the patient's needs. They are ever vigilant about altering the plan of care, recognizing new problems, and meeting the patient's needs. Um, this is, um, nurses seek to understand each person who is suffering as a unique individual. And I've learned a lot from Nessa as she's, you know, written case studies for the ethics series or in observing her at the bedside, either here in the U.S., at Memorial, at, uh, in our work around the world. But it's really, this is, is, you know, it's one of those things when you see an expert nurse, right? You all know what this is. When you've witnessed one of your colleagues, when you see an expert nurse, 
it is a nurse that is truly there to respect who is this individual, who is this person before me. And this is a lovely picture of, 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 of an early uh, patient of Nessa's, and I'm sure Nessa could tell us you know, the story to this day of this man and all of the people that she's cared for. Um, I love these words from Nessa. Nurses pick up the pieces. They put the story together, right? Patients been admitted to your hospice, to your palliative care program, but it is the nurse that helps to weave the story. Who is this person before us? Nurses deal with the meaning of the failed chemotherapy, the radiation therapy, the struggle around the goals of care, the code status. And this, I think, is really beautiful. The nurse listens as the patient creates a new life story. So when you sat there with the 32-year-old who had all the plans in the world of the family was that to be and the career that was to be and how that person would care for their aging parents and now this is a patient who has weeks to live, um, nurses are at the bedside to help create what is that new story to witness this very difficult time. The second theme is that nurses relieve the symptoms of illness. I've thought a lot about this theme because I first met Nessa when she was involved with pain management, as were many of us in this room. We devoted many of our early years to pain management long before there was uh, palliative care and for some of us even when there was no hospice. And I think that um, it was those years. It was that wonderful opportunity that we had for a few decades to focus on the problem of pain that really taught us a lot about how to understand pain as a phenomenon or how to advocate for this one thing called pain. And then from that, we realized that there were more problems than pain. There were more symptoms. But Nessa really has been a pioneer as a nursing leader in relieving the symptoms of illness. As uh, this is from a wonderful paper she wrote, in their own words, seven advanced cancer patients described their experience with pain and the use of opioid drugs. A major aspect of the human experience of illness is symptoms. Nurses respond to symptoms. Nurses care for the person, person surrounding the tumor. Um, addressing pain, giving voice to pain. Pain that is diminished, ignored, or doubted is pain that leads to suffering. Nurses, therefore, have a moral imperative to advocate for pain relief, to give voice to pain, and to reduce suffering. And I can remember really vividly when I first uh, met Nessa 30 years ago this year, and I remember having conversations where we talked about the moral imperative. And people would really be shocked you know, when we would talk about the moral imperative uh, and the moral disgrace to see people who were dying in pain. And yet, it was bold language. And yet, I think Nessa, because she understood the patient's perspective, Nessa could really speak to the moral obligation, because it is a moral obligation um, as healthcare providers to respond to patient suffering. This is also from this wonderful qualitative work that Nessa did uh, with advanced cancer patients. Addressing patients' fear of pain relief, specifically opioids. On one hand, relief from pain was essential to them, but on the other hand, they were troubled with worry that the use of opioid drugs would affect their mental clarity as the price of pain control. What the disease was not able to destroy in their human spirit, the pain, or uncontrolled side effects of the opioids were able to accomplish. And so we've seen Nessa at the bedside responding in a way that is more than just, let's give a higher dose of morphine, but let's pause and hear the patient's story and understand why they're hesitant to take the medication or what this suffering means. Also, I want to point out 1997, um, Nessa was speaking to us about the importance of interprofessional collaboration. Um, she said, with the palliative care team, this new idea, a patient's values are realized and suffering is minimized. Patients' priorities are recognized and not overlooked. Families are included in the care and decision-making 
individual team members are not burdened with unsolved problems, and the team nurtures and is nurtured by the belief that they are facilitating a time of value for the patient. And it was really Nessa working with her colleagues at Memorial Sloan Kettering from psychiatry and social work and medicine, chaplaincy, that really gave rise to that notion that we should be valuing patients, hearing their story, and that we, our role is really facilitating the goals of that patient, all very new ideas at the time. Um, I love this picture. Some of you may know this is Charlie Cleland, and Charlie Cleland was um, also one of the great early pioneers in the area of pain management. Nessa, every time I look at this picture, it looks like you and Charlie are like a lounge act, right? <laughs> I keep, I want to know what song you are singing in this, um, in this, and I also want to know, I've asked several people, we've not been able to diagnose what those hors d'oeuvres were at the, at the table. It's kind of scary, but, um, but these were, the, these were the early days. You know, these were the days when the notion of giving patients morphine was a new idea. These were the days when we really, you know, thought 10 milligrams was the absolute maximum. These were the days when, um, when discussion about fear of addiction was still, you know, just so totally immobilizing in healthcare systems. And so, you know, Nessa, but the thing I want to really say to you is that Nessa was the nursing voice, right? Nessa was the voice of nursing in those conversations about the relief of pain. As Nessa said, with the collaborative team, we must remember the importance and value of the nurse. Nurses play a fundamental role in caring for those who suffer. The relief of suffering is at the core of nurses' work as a profession committed to the human response to illness or injury. Again, 1997. It was also in those early days of pain management that the World Health Organization work began to try to get opioid access in countries around the world that had absolutely no opioids. And so Nessa was working with Charlie Cleland and Kathy Foley and many other colleagues in really opening doors around the world as well as across the United States for this idea that pain is an urgent problem and we really do have a moral obligation. And so Nessa's impact around the world is really profound and I've really had a great opportunity in more recent years to be in many of these countries where Nessa was 20 years ago and people will tell you that about that early work, that uh, you know, advocacy with governments to gain access to opioids, and Nessa was there representing nursing. Uh, this is also a great uh, photo. Some of you may see some familiar faces, particularly on your far left side of the screen is a young Kathy Foley, and um, and also uh, a young Bill Breitbart and. Um, <laughs> Ada Rogers, who was also a wonderful pioneer in nursing. This is from the pain service at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And again, you know what I would say, Nessa, uh, as Sally mentioned, started the Pain and Palliative Care Fellowship where nurses around the country and around the world would come. But when they came to Memorial Sloan Kettering, what did they see? They saw every fellow in the room look at Nessa and say, what should we do, right? They saw Nessa Coyle training Kathy Foley. They saw Nessa collaborating with chaplains and social workers. And so having Nessa as a part of an interdisciplinary team, but a valued part that also brought the voice of nursing can never be underestimated. Um, this again, the third theme is defining the paradigm of palliative nursing, which is comforting always. In reviewing both lay and professional literature, we are struck by how often the relief of suffering is attributed to the medical profession alone. We believe that this likely represents a broader paradigm in which the relief of suffering is meant to equal the cure of disease, a biomedical perspective that implies that the only true relief of suffering comes from fixing, curing, eliminating, and making free of illness rather than the quality of a life lived. This paradigm should be rejected. It does not serve society well, but it may also reflect the invisible 
or silent aspect of nursing care that can have such a profound ameliorating effect on patient and family suffering. Um, this uh, on your screen is a, a beautiful thing, which is comes from the American Journal of Nursing in 1979, an article on analgesics at the bedside. What, an, what a concept. <laughs> Um, and in this article, on the next page of this lovely AJN 1979, is Nessa. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the amazing thing is we could take this article and um, put a new picture of Nessa and publish it next week. And, you know, the ideas are the same. Because what Nessa was speaking of then and what Nessa speaks about now is listen to the patient. It's the patient's pain. Pain is a crisis. Pain is a medical emergency. And everything that we can do to put the patient in control of their pain is really our obligation. It is our obligation. And so, again, for every person in this room who today advocates for better pain, please stop by and give Nessa a big hug on your way out today. Because if Nessa wasn't talking about this 30 and 40 years ago, you would not be here today as hospice and palliative care nurses. This is also a, a wonderful picture, and um, again, I just wanted to, again, you know, echo the international impact of Nessa's work, and that's Balfour Mount, the, the sort of godfather of palliative care in Canada, and Nessa has done wonderful work early with, uh, with Balfour Mount and colleagues uh, in uh, Canada and around the world, because this really is, as we all know, this is a global community that we are all advocating around the world for attention to suffering, to relief of pain, and now for the development of palliative care. The fourth theme in Nessa's work that we identified was communication as essential, as the essence of nursing. It is the nurse who is the facilitator in goals of care conversations. Nurses need effective communication skills. And care that is consistent with the patient's preferences Patients who have conversations about their wishes for end-of-life care are more likely to receive care consistent with their preferences. And again, we can never you know, overstate how important it is now that nurses are at the bedside helping to hear the patient's story, helping to ask, you know, who are you and what should we know about you and what is important to you so that we can advocate. But we can't do that without excellent communication skills. And Nesta has really pioneered much of her work at Memorial Sloan Kettering in excellent communication. Um, end of life discussions are associated with fewer occurrences of resuscitation, ventilation, death in the intensive care unit, earlier referral to palliative care and hospice services, and better quality of life. In addition to all of her work in pain and palliative care, Ness has been a vital force at Memorial and continues to volunteer there on, as an ethics consultant. And again, people have traveled from all over the country and all over the world to see um, what this model ethics consultation service looks like and to observe the work um, in supportive care. Um, this picture of Nessa I also really love. And, um, and I'll tell you why. I think every one of us in this room understands the notion of compassion. And probably most all of us in this room at this point in our careers are pretty good at being compassionate with patients and families. But I think many of us in this room would probably admit that we are not so good at being compassionate with our colleagues. And something I've learned from Nessa over all of these years and something I've witnessed from Nessa is that she is as compassionate and as engaged with her professional colleagues as she is with patients and families. When I saw this picture, I mean, if you look at this picture, this is Nessa teaching nurses, right? Teaching a group of nurses in uh, one of our Eastern European uh, training programs. But what you see is, I mean, you can just see in this picture, this is Nessa who's so engaged and so connected with her colleagues. She's listening to her colleagues 
in the same way that we listen to patients. She's speaking to her colleagues. She cares about her colleagues. And I think that having that degree of compassion with the people that you're trying to teach and influence is very central to Nessa's success. And again, we who have, anyone who has been able to observe her with colleagues and in teaching or in coaching new fellows on how to have a goals of care conversation, you know that this is what Nessa has taught us. A good death is clarification of the patient's goals of care may help achieve a good death. Patients describe a good death as being in control, being comfortable, having a sense of closure, having trust in care providers, recognizing the impending death, and leaving a legacy. And again, you can see the words on this screen. This is how our field has evolved. Pick up the palliative care journal or the palliative care textbook. Go to any session that's being held at this meeting. These are the things that have now become the essence of our field. And they became the essence of our field because of Nessa and other pioneers who said this is what it's about, right? This is what palliative care looks like. Patient-centered care, skilled and compassionate communication by the nurse can help place the patient back at the center of the decision. What are the patient's values and goals? What would the patient want if they could speak for themselves? What is possible? How has the patient lived their life? And what constitutes good medical care for this patient? Nessa also wrote a wonderful, wonderful, one of the many things that she's written since the time of the controversies around assisted suicide uh, in the United States and of course around the world. And Nessa did this, again, amazing work. If you've not read this, everyone should read this work. Um, it was published in 2004 in the Oncology Nursing Forum, Expressed Desire for Hastened Death in Seven Patients Living with Advanced Cancer, a Phenomenological Inquiry. She said, listening to patients' stories through the narrative interview and giving them an opportunity to describe their lived experience of advanced cancer may help nurses and others to understand what actually is being asked when a patient expresses desire for hastened death. I can remember vividly when the assisted suicide controversy began, and I can remember being at some of the first pain meetings around this issue. And I was like most everybody else. We were all in our corners, in our divided camps. I was screaming and ranting and raving like a crazy person. And there was Nessa, this voice of reason in the middle of the room, saying things like, and why did the patient ask for this, right? So it is, um, but I think that is really what Nessa has taught us, that whether it is assisted suicide or withdrawal of life support or nutrition and hydration, that what Nessa has done is to really teach us that it is about the patient's story. It is about listening and seeking to understand why. It is to what is being asked and what, what is it that we can do to respond to this patient's suffering. The fifth theme is presence. And um, again, I, I think Nessa defined presence. I think she defined it in her scholarly work. I think she defined it at the bedside. I think she has taught hundreds, thousands of people about what presence means. The simple presence of one who is concerned, one who is willing to be a companion and to remain steadfast when there are no easy answers is itself a form of powerful communication that goes beyond words. Establish contact through active listening. Again, the lovely Nessa, who's always present. She's just, isn't she? It's just her being. Um, the sixth theme is illness as a family experience. And, you know, I, I find this so fascinating. There's, there are, in many corners of our current world of palliative care, I was at the NIH last week having some conversations with people about family caregiving. 
The Institute of Medicine issued a report just a few months ago on family caregiving. There is a whole new body of scholarly work and research interest in family caregiving. It, it, there's, this is the time with our aging society and shift to community-based care that family caregiving is so you know, on the radar screen. But how did that happen? You know, we did not get to the year 2017 of everyone recognizing family caregivers unless we had people like Nessa who 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 years ago were saying the illness is about the family, right? That family caregivers are not passive observers. Family caregivers, if one person is in pain, a family is in pain. If one person is dealing with profound fatigue, a family is dealing with profound fatigue. Nessa said family members often become a reflection of the patient's suffering as that reflection is cast back onto the patient. Suffering within families is both an intensely individual experience as each son, daughter, or spouse responds within their relationship as well as a collective shared suffering experience of family. The seventh theme is ethical issues inherent in the scope of palliative nursing. And this was a, a quite wonderful uh, paper that, uh, again, Nessa wrote in 2004 entitled Ignorance of Palliative Care Clouds the Debate. She said, the debate has brought into focus just how inadequately we care for the dying. Few doctors and nurses are specifically trained to take care of dying patients. As a consequence, many terminally ill patients have had very limited knowledge of and access to skilled palliative care. Um, again, some of Nessa's influence. So this is Neil uh, McDonald on the far left side of the screen, again, a leader in Canada, Nathan Cherney in Israel. When I saw this picture, the leadership principle here is, I thought, Nessa, you look so small. Oh my gosh, <laughs> whoa. Um, and uh, that's Neil McDonald. And so I think the leadership principle here is surround yourself with giants, right? <laughs> Um, the eighth theme is mentoring present and future generations of nurses. And Nessa, really, above anyone I've ever known, is the person that mentors our present and future generations. And again, in true Nessa form, you know, you won't see Nessa necessarily, um, you know, in some formal mentorship or, uh, you know, in some public capacity, but what you will see is that at the bedside, in a home visit, um, in an ethics consult, uh, in a late ICU family meeting, that Nessa is there to not only deliver the care, but to really bring that young nurse to the bedside. Um, she said, nursing education has been guided by a nursing process and a nursing care plan that often resembled a checklist of actions to restore the sick to health. Our educational program lacked a philosophy, role modeling, and a reward for behavior such as compassion and presence. And communication in nursing practice was reduced to patient teaching, not listening or witnessing suffering. And wow, what important words that has for us for the future. If we could all go home from this meeting and just think about those words alone, if we could all go back um, you know, next Monday and think about the ways that we can mentor others in terms of moving beyond patient teaching. And are we really mentoring um, our future generations in terms of listening? And are we there at the bedside in terms of witnessing suffering? Uh, Nessa wrote uh, quite a beautiful uh, narrative that's uh, in the suffering book about being in another country and observing a nurse who was caring for a dying child in the midst of absolutely no access to any medications. But what is central to me every time I read that story over and over again is that Nessa was there. Nessa was there with that nurse as that nurse held a dying child with no access to medications. Nurse Nessa has been there um, in those impossible ICU situations. 
um, when a patient was dying in horribly futile care, Nessa didn't leave, she was present. And mentoring nurses and other colleagues, and I think Nessa has mentored as many people in other professions as she has in nursing, is about teaching nurses how to be fully present and what it means to truly witness suffering. Um, again, wonderful work uh, around the world. Um, and I think the concept of healing is central to Nessa's work as well. This is from The Nature of Suffering. Somewhere on the journey to learning the art of healing, many nurses have had the profound gift of witnessing true nursing by a seasoned and compassionate colleague. Watching a nurse who is fully present, who listens carefully, and says little but provides the sufferer the opportunity of voice, as described by Reich, is a true education. Such mentors teach that silencing or stifling the voice of suffering serves only to intensify it. Mark Lassenby is a faculty member at Yale University now, a philosopher, a ethicist, and now a PhD nurse. And he uh, just published, actually a few weeks ago, his book came out on caring, caring matters most, the ethical significance of nursing. And he said, caring is a way of life. We cannot merely say that we care or read about caring in a textbook, nodding our heads in agreement, we must live and practice in such a way as to show we care. Through our nursing practice, we show our patients and their communities to our colleagues in nursing and in other health professions and to our families and friends that we care. Perhaps most important, we must show it to each other for it is from nurses who care that we learn to care. And Nessa, I think you've taught many of us what it means to care. Again, Nessa's ethical work in this final theme, nurses are guided by ethical perspectives that extend beyond professional codes and call upon basic human kindness and compassion as they are called to embrace spirituality in its most global sense. The expert nurse knows that much redemption happens when a hostile family member assists in a bath, a frightened husband spoon feeds his spouse a few sips. You can see the picture of what it means to comfort. In Mark Lassenby's caring book just released, um, as, as I read Mark's book, it reminded me so much, and Mark has been so influenced by Nessa's work, but one of the themes he writes about is nursing imagination. And, um, you know, we, most of us stand in sort of profound awe of Nessa, but we also have experienced a lot of joy and laughter and amazement because Nessa is, has imagination like you wouldn't believe. Um, so Mark said, nursing imagination establishes the hope of a health promoted, health restored, or life safely passing. When we are able to help our patients achieve that through our imagination, we have resisted the threat of becoming an automaton. This is the ethical significance of imagination in our everyday lives as nurses. And this is so about Nessa. Um, uh, you know, I have many pictures of Nessa, and every picture I look at of Nessa with, with her colleagues, with strangers around the world, with patients, with families, this is Nessa, right? She radiates this, this love and presence and human kindness and all of those words that you just saw. And when you just are around her, I mean, I've been with Nessa throughout the world in, in many, many countries. We train throughout Eastern Europe, and it's like you don't even have to do anything. You just like send Nessa in for a while, and then <laughs> they get it, right? Because she's just so loving and radiant and wonderful. And this is just, this is so Nessa. Um, around the world, around country to country, colleagues, patients, families, um, Nessa really has taught us a lot about basic human kindness. And finally, this is um, one of my other favorite pictures uh, uh, from Travels Around the World. 
Um, this is, um, again, Judy Pace, along with Nessa, um, Mary Calloway, and there's no excuse for Pat Coyne. I mean, Pat, <laughs> wear, wear your hairdress. Um, but again, I would say that, you know, being with and working with Nessa has also taught us the importance of joy and laughter and adventure and seizing to know and understand and respect every culture around the world. And um, working with Nessa, being with Nessa, doing palliative care with Nessa is a lot about joy. So um, with that, that is a very quick summary of the themes of Nessa's work and her scholarship. And you can see why HPNA has established this fund in her honor. And so, once again, I would just invite all of us to stand and applaud this wonderful colleague and her career. I just want to thank everybody for being here today and um, have a good rest of the conference. <laughs>